in Athens, but also Stavros is a visiting researcher at the Eric Kastron Institute at the University of Helsinki and an associate fellow with the Asser Institute in The Hague. Uh, Stavros has been a founding member of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association and the chair of its Law Endurance Group. He's a managing editor of the Yearbook of International Humanitarian Law. Uh, Stavros holds a PhD from the European University Institute in Florence, and he has worked as a postdoctoral researcher also with the Toxic Crimes Project at the University of Helsinki with NGOs, especially one based here in UK. But also he has assisted uh, the UN International Law Commission Special Rapporteurs on the Protection of the Environment in Relation to Armed Conflicts, both in 2015 and 2022. So without saying further about Stavros, you realize that we have with us a real expert in this very, very interesting topic. And uh, in this regard, um, I stop here and I give the floor to Stavros. Stavros, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, I would like to say that after his presentation, you can put your questions on chat and we will he will respond to all the questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Stavros. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Maria. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here with you, uh, part of this series. Um, and of course, to speak before uh, your expert audience. Um, so today, and I think I will start sharing uh, my screen because if you prevented a couple of slides. Uh, to facilitate our discussion. Here it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so. I hope it's visible. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, okay, nice. Thanks. And um, so I uh, Today, I would just like to single out and identify uh, certain trends um, that are discernible in the broader field, what we call PERAC, uh, which stands for Protection of the Environment in Relation to Armed Conflicts. Uh, and I will focus a bit on this um, uh, connecting word in relation to, usually, you know, we speak about um, in bello, at bellum, post bellum. Uh, we give a temporal, uh, we provide a temporal qualification, but this is broad enough and I will explain the reasons uh, for this connecting phrase, uh, environmental protection in relation to armed conflicts. Um, I will um, say a few words about the two uh, quite recent legal initiatives in this field, uh, the International Law Commissions, the ILCs, PERAC principles, adapted in 2022 and of course the 2020 ICSC guidelines, International Committee of the Red Cross, on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts. Uh, again, the connecting word is interesting. Um, then um, I will attempt to uh, identify um, concrete developments in the broader area, in the broader regime of international uh, criminal law. Um, some, ident uh, some trends uh, in this domain in the broader field of uh, PERAC, the legal uh, PERAC, either uh, within IHL, ICL, etc. And of course, some conclu concluding thoughts that uh, hopefully uh, will provide uh, further, uh, will instigate further discussion. Let me uh, get quickly um, to this question. Why focus on PERAC now? Um, I mean, we, we know very well since ancient times, destruction of the environment, using the environment as a weapon, poisoning uh, wells, scorched earth policies, etc., etc., uh, has been um, a, a tactic, a method of warfare, commonly used by, you, by humans throughout the centuries. Why do we focus now on this, and especially, um, I mean, in the 21st century? Um, especially after the Second World War, um, one main concern relates to technological developments um, in this area. Um, the uh, weapons of mass destruction, etc., uh, and of course the looming danger, the looming risk of permanent destruction, and of course the understanding, especially after um, the fifth, uh, the seventies, with the adoption of the Stockholm Declaration, this idea of uh, inter generational and intergenerational equity, the idea that we also have to protect um, um, the environment, the natural environment for the benefit of future um, generations. This is more or less 
if we situate it, you know, in a broad spectrum, recent line of thinking. And of course, it has also influenced the way we approach wartime conduct and the respective provisions and protections. Um, in this respect, I get back here. Um, when it comes to legal Iraq, the legal protection for the two Iraq, um, we I usually and of course also other scholars uh, um, historicize, periodize uh, the the legal regulation in three phases. Of course, the main one uh, was the awareness on behalf of the international community raised by um, the conduct of US troops uh, in the context of the Vietnam War, the use of uh, Agent Orange, defoliants, etc., that caused um, destruction to the environment. And of course, um, this main development coupled with other developments back in that uh, time led to the adoption of hard law, if I can put it like this, um, to environment specific rules contained in additional protocol one of 1977 and of course in a parallel uh, process also the conclusion of the animal convention the uh, prohibition on, on uh, environmental modification techniques adapted in 1976. this was more or less the first era uh, marked by hard law formal law and of course um, by um, the dominance of states in the jury's generative process. This was a way of regulating matters back then. The second phase uh, could be identified, could be uh, situated uh, in the 90s. Uh, this is the end of uh, the Cold War. It's this period uh, where uh, the a promise, the promise of a liberal, liberal international law comes into prominence, into existence. The idea that cooperation will solve our problems, etc. Of course, um, it quickly led to disillusionment, but back, back then that was the spirit, especially in the early 90s. Um, and this is when the image comes from that time, the Iraqi invasion and occupation of uh, Kuwait, which of course led to um, United Nations Security Council resolution um, authorizing use of force. Uh, and of course, uh, Saddam's forces were ousted by Kuwait through uh, the conduct um, of this coalition. And this the Security Council also established the United Nations Compensation Commission, UNCC, um, vested with a mandate of adjudicating claims relating to the illegal invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq. Part of these claims, uh, the so-called F4 claims, were environmental claims, claims relating to um, environmental, um, detrimental environmental effects. And we will get back to this issue of uh, UNCC. Other actors also uh, were active during the time, UNEP, especially United Nations Environment Program, conducting post-conflict environmental assessments, technical assessments, uh, pinpointing where expert intervention is needed and of course urgent intervention in order to to grapple with uh, environmental problems arising out of conflict uh, situations so UNEP was also instrumental in, in that time M moving forward and turning to uh, the ongoing third phase which uh, started and is still ongoing it started in the 21st century. We see also other international bodies being involved uh, with uh, PERAC, with one way or another, and of course within their mandate and um, scope uh, of work. Uh, for example, uh, we see also the ICC uh, being involved in this, even if at this point of time at a normative level so far, there is no concrete jurisprudential finding. Uh, up to this point, uh, the ICJ is also the International Court of Justice is also uh, preoccupying itself with uh, claims relating to wartime uh, conduct that leads to environmental damage. And of course, um, other actors, the Security Council as well, when it establishes um, specific peacekeeping operations, and then they are vested uh, with a mandate dealing also with the protection of the natural environment and other actors as well. This is the third ongoing phase according to uh, the periodization I follow. Um, so let's see 
these most recent developments within this third phase. As I mentioned before, the first phase was hard law, state-driven, formal law, uh, traditional uh, international law, if I can put it this way. Uh, the tide has turned, of course. We know that within IHL, it is very difficult uh, nowadays to reach uh, agreements, um, you know, common understanding on hard law, a treaty, etc. Usually we end up with uh, political declar declarations, some uh, soft law resolutions, and this is the maximum we can get if we approach things from a formalist perspective. Um, so two influential actors, the ILC on the one hand and the International Committee of the Red Cross were also involved in this domain. Uh, the, their effort um, was instigated by a report which was issued by UNEP in 2009, an inventory, as it was called back then. And UNEP back then, 2009, uh, called upon these two bodies, the ILC and the ICRC, uh, to be involved in that matter in order to clarify applicable rules. In other words, international community was not so happy about the state of the law when it comes to Iraq environmental protection in relation to armed conflict. The law uh, was a bit outdated. Um, I mean, 1977, the understanding, um, the human understanding of uh, the importance of the environment has significantly evolved since the times. And these rules dating back to the 70s, of course, were deemed to be insufficient. The ILC and the ICRC took up this challenge. And after working on these aspects, more or less 10 years each, they came up with two uh, very important legal instruments. The ICRC published uh, the 2020 guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts. Uh, which in essence uh, clarifies, uh, provides, expresses the view of the ICRC um, uh, on the applicable law pertaining to environmental protection in times of armed conflict. We should always, we should also bear in mind the ICRC's mandate uh, in that respect. The ILC adopted the broader lens um, of um, of. Uh, of work, so they had the chance to deal with cross-cutting issues. They adopted a temporal approach. They divided their work um, in many phases, covering the entire conflict cycle. So if you have a look at the 2022 PERAC principles, the ILC PERAC principles, which actually uh, were taken note of by the United Nations General Assembly in December 22. Uh, you can see uh, that there are different parts. For example, one part uh, deals with principles of general application throughout phases. Uh, there is another part dealing with uh, principles applicable during armed conflicts in Bello, in our traditional um, way of approaching uh, IHL. Uh, there is a separate part uh, which applies in situations of occupation and another part covering the post-conflict phase. So it covers the entire spectrum of um, conflict. Uh, in terms of normativity, there has been some discussion before the General Assembly. States were expressing their views, of course. And within the ILC, some commissioners, members of the commission, um, uh, various views were uh, expressed. Uh, the understanding is that these principles vary uh, in terms of normativity. So some of them, uh, we could easily say that they reflect existing customary international law. They codify international law, to put it in uh, the words of the ILC's statute. And there are also other principles uh, in the form of um, progressive development of international law. We can see them as best practice recommendations, of course, building upon existing practice. Okay, They don't come um, out of the blue. Um, so they vary in terms of normativity. Um, they are quite um, insightful, uh, interdisciplinary. They bring together um, insights from different branches of international law, IHL, uh, international environmental law, international human rights law, etc. Uh, and in my view, this could form the point of reference for the years to come, the ILC's uh, principles. It's a very helpful guide for states and other stakeholders because it does not only address state conduct, but also the conduct of uh, other stakeholders. For example, 
international organizations, non-state armed groups in the context of a non-international armed conflict, NGOs, um, etc., etc. So this is the general context when it comes to these uh, two most recent legal initiatives. Um, and if we approach it from another lens, um, and when it comes to IHL, we can see that there are some environment-specific rules, rules uh, stipulating specific protection uh, for the environment. Um, and these, for example, as such, uh, we could qualify the two environment-specific provisions of additional protocol one, Article 35, 3 uh, and 55. Uh, or, for example, the uh, prohibitions enshrined in the Enwood Convention of 1976. And then we can also draw insights and um, look uh, for GASIC guidance from general, general routes and their transposition, their concretization when it comes to environmental protection, uh, general rules and principles such as uh, the rules of distinction, uh, the rules of proportionality, precautions, uh, military necessity, uh, etc. So um, this is how general rules could provide protection to uh, the environment and parts thereof. And of course, indirect protection in the form of rules covering specially protected protected objects. For example, rules protecting um, cultural property uh, or a site um, which has uh, mixed features that should be protected both of its uh, cultural uh, and natural uh, character. So in this way, this is indirect protection. We can also, you know, uh, identify uh, with a third case rules um, such as uh, prohibitions on attacking installations containing dangerous forces, etc. This is in, uh, indirect protection afforded to the environment. Uh, I do have an you know, just I have uh, grouped them here for our convenience. Uh, and here is the provision of um, the environment specific rule uh, found in AP1, as you can see, reiterated uh, in the very second rule of the 2020 ICRC guidelines. And of course, in the direct principles, you see that there is a common understanding among these documents, among these instruments. Formal law, okay, sure, the first one. But uh, the other two could easily, easily, very easily uh, be claimed that they reflect existing customer international law. You, we can also see here, we can also deduce from this provision that the threshold of protection is quite high. I have highlighted in red, uh, you know, this uh, conjunctive connection. And all these three qualifiers, all these three requirements have to be fulfilled at the same time. The threshold is quite high, the threshold of prescribed environmental damage. It is absolute, sure, granted. It's not subjected to any kind of proportionality balancing test, etc. But it's very high. This is 1977. We should also bear this in mind. Uh, there are more rules. I can just, you know, um, single out some. Um, now in the ICC guidelines, destruction of the environment may not be used as a weapon. And you see here how the guidelines make the connection with ecocide, and I will get back to this point later on. Another uh, cross-cutting understanding here, um, the general rules. How do they apply? There was a discussion and debate in the beginning of these processes, but it was resolved uh, quite rapidly. And of course, in favor of acknowledging that the environment and parts thereof are in principle uh, civilian objects. Okay, they are civilian objects unless they become military objectives. And by virtue of this acknowledgement, all the other general rules on the conduct of hostilities, proportionality, prohibition of indiscriminate attacks, precautions in attack and in defense, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they apply because the environment is a civilian object unless it becomes a military objective. So it benefits from all these general rules. And this is a cross-cutting understanding. Turning to uh, the international criminal law developments, um, of course, the pivotal uh, rule, the focus point is the environment, um, the environmental war crime as identified uh, in the ICC statute. 
first point to bear into mind is that it applies only in the context of international armed conflicts. Okay. Uh, of course, um, the wording is similar with AP1, the environment specific provision of AP1, which again applies in the context of uh, international armed conflicts. Uh, so, state the drafters could not agree about actually they did agree that they don't want to extend this type of protection of prohibition uh, to cases of non-international armed conflicts the threshold again is quite high you see this disjunctive articulation uh, excuse me conjunctive art articulation widespread long term and severe and of course uh, given that we are talking about individual criminal responsibility, um, this threshold, even if it is met, it has to be balanced, again, as you can see, the concrete and direct overall military advantage anticipated. Um, it was, um, you know, very quickly claimed that uh, this provision can only be met by the use of nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. Um, it would be very difficult, uh, impossible to meet, even though in recent times, um, last year, June 23, there was some discussion whether the destruction of the Novokakhovka Dam in Ukraine um, could fulfill this threshold, triggering uh, individual criminal responsibility for the commission for the perpetration of a war crime. So perhaps it's not only about using um, mass destruction weapons, but conventional weapons could also uh, make the case. Of course, there are other issues, whether that situation back there uh, could qualify as an attack. Because if you, you know, if you read it from the beginning, you see that, okay, mens rea, intentionality, launching an attack. There are some issues, but um, so far, this provision has not been used in the work of the uh, ICC. It has not, we don't have any case law relating to this uh, provision, but it is there, the so-called um, environmental war crime applicable in international armed conflicts. Um, the awareness of uh, human community just keeps evolving when it comes to environmental protection. Uh, many uh, institutions, states, stakeholders were not happy uh, that there was no um, case law um, with relation to the environmental war crime uh, and of course they wanted something more so in 2016 the office of the prosecutor of the icc publishes a policy paper on case selection and prioritization and this is the famous paragraph 41 where we have a concrete a specific reference direct reference to the destruction of the environment okay we're in 2016 uh in a sense showcasing heightened interest and the um the need the willingness to prioritize such instances fast forward 2024 no outcome no concrete at least tangible outcome has come out of this uh, process it has not been used as at least it was intended to uh, back in 2016 but it was there so in the process of, um, in the context of ICL, international criminal law, the first landmark point is 1998, ICC statute, environmental war crime. And then the second important uh, watershed moment, it could have been 2016, but there was no follow-up, no meaningful um, follow-up. Um, and this leads us to uh, the, the current uh, decade. Perhaps you've heard of the um, initiative undertaken by the Stopico Site Foundation. It established an independent expert panel, IEP, um, which adapted, agreed on a definition uh, and, of course, uh, uh, accompanied with a related commentary definition of the so called fifth international crime, ecocide, with the intention of amending the ICC statute and including that. Uh, the fifth crime, the crime of ecocide within the statute. Uh, I will not get into the specifics about the procedure in order to get this done. I, I will only mention that in two months ago, uh, three states asked, uh, uh, formally expressed their willingness to trigger this amendment uh, procedure. And we it's remained to be seen how other state parties to the ICC statute will react and to what extent they would be willing to initiate 
the process of amending the ICC statute. Um, ecocide, of course, is broader, the notion of ecocide than the environmental war crime I mentioned uh, before. And you see here, paragraph one is the definition that the IEP, the Independent Expert Panel, agreed on in June 2021. 20, and of course, this will be the working definition of any potential, uh, any future effort to amend the ICC statute. This will be the starting point. Um, some parts will have to be dropped, they will be adjusted. Of course, this is an intergovernmental uh, process, but this could be, uh, as it seems, the starting uh, point. Many criticisms, again, um, or at least uh, constructive ideas about uh, mainstream or the articulation. You can he see here the interesting articulation of these three qualifiers is to be severe and either widespread or long term. So we are looking for two out of three, severe being the indispensable one. Uh, in the case before, remember it was uh, three out of three. We need all these three required. The threshold has been lowered. This is just not to, uh, to bear in mind. Of course, there are also domestic ecocide laws. This is the Ukrainian criminal code, Article 40, uh, 441, uh, on the basis of which uh, we already have uh, some ongoing investigations. Okay. In the context, of course, of the uh, Ukraine uh, Russian Federation armed conflict, especially after the full scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia in February 22. This is how a domestic ecocide law that of Ukraine uh, approaches this issue. This is the crime of ecocide. You see, it's not only about uh, wartime conduct, it's broader than that. How much broader? This is something uh, that states will have to decide if they agree to proceed with uh, the fifth international crime. Some final points just to uh, so as to move on to the discussion part. Um, these are some institutions we can draw inspiration from. I mentioned before the UN uh, Compensation Commission in the context of the Iraq Kuwait, um, actually of the illegal invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq, some interesting quasi-jurisprudential uh, findings in terms of causation of environmental damage, uh, what kind of damage is compensable. Uh, an interesting finding therein in the case of the UNCC is that pure environmental damage is compensable. Right? It does not have to be linked to any kind of human activity uh, or any kind of human resource or human suffering. Environmental damage as such is compensable. This is something we know from the case law of the UNCC. Recently, two years ago, uh, in February 22, uh, we had the uh, reparations judgment in the context of the DRC Uganda case before the ICJ. And the ICJ had to deal uh, with uh, actual conduct of an occupying power in relation to using and uh, exploiting natural resources, which is relevant for our purposes. And of course, in most recent times, and fast forward to an ongoing situation, the register of damage uh, uh, situated uh, at The Hague, uh, which of course deals with damage flowing from the uh, aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. Within the mandate of this uh, register of damage, um, the board agreed to also include environmental claims following the example of the UNCC. Uh, just to keep something in mind in that respect, these claims, um, environmental damage claims, as you can see, relating to the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, of course, are connected with a use at bellum violation. It's not about IHL. It's not about ICL, uh, the ascription of individual criminal responsibility, but they flow from the aggression of the Russian Federation. Use at bellum, and this actually was the legal basis uh, that the UNCC uh, operated on, uh, the illegal invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq. Concluding remarks, um, in this presentation, I attempted to demonstrate that there is increased activity, or at least uh, throughout the last decade, there is. And there has been increased activity at the normative level, either at the juris generative process, or when it comes to uh, jurisprudential or quasi-jurisprudential findings 
the activity within the ICC, the register of damage, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, also some activity uh, in the front of adapting uh, the crime of ecocide. Uh, we see also that um, the uh, European uh, Union has been active in that front uh, and some other uh, states because so far domestic ecocide laws uh, are mostly situated in the criminal codes of post-Soviet states uh, which were inspired of the Chernobyl uh, disaster. That's why uh, these post-Soviet states ended up with ecocide provisions in their criminal codes. But now this trend um, uh, is being expanded gradually. Let's see if it's also going to end up in the ICC statute. The need to document such damage with a view of obtaining compensation at a later level. This is the idea of the register of damage. First, we it serves as uh, a database, if I can put it like that. Uh, they collect all these claims in the documentation, and at a later level, at a later stage, the idea is to institute to establish a claims commission mechanism in order to grant compensation. So it's a two-step uh, process, but the first step is documentation. And in that respect, um, of course, the role of new technologies is fundamental. Uh, Ukraine is also very active in that respect, but also other stakeholders, uh, UNEP, NGOs, um, etc., documenting environmental damage, both in order to um, proceed with a rapid response and address urgent environmental risks, but also with the intention of granting compensation at a level at a later stage where uh, the conditions will be more mature. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Stavros. This was a very rich uh, presentation uh, regarding normative developments, but also it's, um, institutional developments. Uh, and you really, really uh, brought uh, the perspective for different branches, as you say, of international law, not only IHL, but uh, ICL, the use at Bellum, I would say also human rights law. Uh, here and the particular example of Ukraine uh, is is very enlightening with regard to uh, to what happens domestically, but also on the, on the uh, on an international level. Uh, I have invited our um, uh, attendees to to raise questions if they want on chat or even if they want to take the floor, if that's possible. <laughs> I don't know, Liz, uh, but maybe you would like some more time. Maybe I can start with the question myself, and then you know I can I can. So for the others to follow up and 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 i have oh sorry okay yeah yes. yeah and and, and uh, i have two questions but i will start with the first one they're more general questions so um, i was wondering because you talked about different branches of law so you 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 mentioned the intergenerational equity um uh, if I can say doctrine, uh, idea developing. And I was wondering, you know, about this new declaration we have from the UN on future generation, for example, or how the right to life has been linked by the Human Rights Committee in General Common 36 with the environment. Uh, or what else did I write? Or even to what extent, you know, all the climate um, change litigation. Uh, and I wonder whether you see, you know, the, as a broader context uh, of interest um, and how that what is the relationship you know how that correlates with 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 a particular with a more specific issue of environmental protection within or after or during armed conflict so do you see it as a as a unified uh, stream or something you know or two things that uh, work on a parallel level so that would be my initial question no yeah. It's a great question. Also, because we, you know, we attempt, we usually tend to uh, approach these issues on binaries. So either it could be peace or war, and then even if we are at war, you know, we have like speci uh, specialis, specialis, I excel in human rights law. End of the story. We tried to insert into the calculus use at bellum, as you mentioned, um, um, general comment thirty six, and then it's not quite clear what how the equation will look like we are facing some problems um 
Um, and with human rights law, we do have some jurisprudence, ICJ, regional courts, etc. Um, but with other areas, it's not so clear. Uh, first of all, what is Lex Specialis, Specialis for example? Uh, you know, it's, it's a classic thing with uh, environmental protection. Okay, war time is special to uh, the situation of normalcy, which is peace. So, in principle, IHL laws of war should be uh, the Lex Specialis, but then, you know, if you approach it from the object of the of protection, the environment, then IEL, international environmental law, is uh, more special. So, at the end, not so helpful. Of course, our understanding has evolved since that. It's not about regime interaction. It's about, you know, concrete rules and how they apply in specific contexts. Um, but still, with the environment is not so clear. And especially if we add these, uh, this dimension of uh, human rights, law protection, um, it gets even messier. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to specific uh, international environmental, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, for example, because you, you refer to climate change rightly so, and this is a discussion we are having right now, um, how climate change considerations should be taken into account, because we know at this point of time, we know it has been documented, um, you know, that it's a, a bi-directional uh, situation. So uh, conflict exacerbates uh, it could exacerbate um, climate change, increased emissions, uh, decreased resilience, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it can also go to the other way. A climate change stresses could also lead uh, to conflict and conflict. So it cuts both ways. So we know at this point of time, we know. Perhaps it's not a strict causation. Sure, I'm not saying the opposite, but there is a correlation out there so how to take this into account and the doctrinal issue here is how multilateral environmental agreements apply in times of war if we have resolved more or less or at least this seems to be the majority position that there is a presumption in favor of continued applicability fair fine that's great a nice starting point but then again when it comes to concrete rules concrete cases how can we draw some insights from the 2015 Paris Agreement, you know, and uh, be of help uh, in times of war? Situations of occupation, I see that perhaps this could be the first uh, test case because it's uh, more stable. Uh, the law of uh, international and conflict applies, but it's a more stable uh, situation. Uh, it's it's reasonable to have some expectations from the occupying power in terms of um, documenting, in terms of measuring emissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then at the normative level, and uh, something tells me that you are uh, more interested um, into this, um, I'm not so sure. Of course, some colleagues um, have worked on these issues, how these three regimes um, could... Um, What's the interplay between three regimes, IHL rules, multilateral environmental agreements, or even customary IEL, and um, human rights law? Um, but I'm not sure how this will play out um, in practice. And of course, we should also bear in mind that, you know, who is going to tell us, more or less, at least this is my estimation and speculation, is that it's going to be like human rights law. We will have a word from human rights courts, which, of course, uh, even, you know, when two regimes were at play, IHL and human rights law, there was this constant concern that they approach the issue from their expertise, mandate, etc. Uh, so perhaps the relationship between these three regimes um, will not be articulated um, in a precise manner. But this is, a, I don't want to blame uh, the judges of these courts or anything uh, like that. Even, you know, if we had a, a world environmental court, again, we would say, you know what, they approach this issue from the perspective of intergenerational equity. But here, lives matter, someone is going to die. Uh, not a very uh, clear answer. Uh, in short, I would say this is a work in progress. Uh, and it's quite likely, uh, if I want to, you know, insert kind of prognostic value in my statement, that uh, as it happens with climate change mitigation, because you referred to this one as well, uh, we will wait and see how human rights fare in that respect and then draw uh, insights, perhaps to the detriment of environmental protection, because it will be under-prioritized. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid that this will be uh, the, the future trajectory. 
Thank you very much. Uh, any other any question from 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 the audience? You know, because I have many many questions myself, but it's not fair. You know, I would like to give uh, the oh, okay. There is something. Thank you, Liz. Yes. Uh, yes. Have you read it? Uh, can you read it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, Liz, that's, that's a great point. Also, because I forgot to mention in my uh, in my speech, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, within ICC statute in 1998, the environment specific war crime. Fine. 2016, ICC uh, office of the prosecutor policy paper with no follow up. I forgot an important uh, date, um, February 24, when prosecutor Han. Um, uh, announces that the Office of the Prosecutor will um, publish a policy paper dealing with environmental crimes. Uh, so the idea they, they collected, uh, there was the first round of uh, deliberations. Uh, they're now in the uh, in the process of finalizing this document. It was expected to be published at the end of this calendar year, December 24. Let's see, usually they follow up with these uh, promises, if I can put it like this, so it is to be expected sooner or later. Uh, the idea is to identify how existing international crimes, th those that you also referred to uh, in this very helpful uh, and insightful question, Liz, uh, how these crimes could be used in order to capture, if I can put it like that, uh, environmental damage, either wartime or not, because we know, for example, that in cases of you know the crimes genocide or crimes against humanity uh, the the connection with an armed conflict is not um, a necessary precondition even though in practice uh, usually there is a connection uh, so they attempt to outline how this could be used to capture uh, environmental damage and there is some work on these matters even like uh, 20 years ago when the icc statute uh, first entered into force how different provisions um can be used even for example to capture uh, climate change uh, considerations uh, in this respect or for example deforestation as a crime against humanity uh, of course with all the menstrual requirements being fulfilled it's not uh, very serious solid legal um, analysis in that respect uh, so we are really looking forward to see how the office of the prosecutor will approach these issues and i'm also personally curious to see how these will um, interact with the other ongoing process, what I mentioned, what I didn't forget to mention in my presentation, the, uh, the process of amending the ICC statute in order to include the so-called fifth international crime. Will it detract attention? Uh, is it possible to, uh, in a way, uh, pursue both these two options? Will one be prioritized over the other? Uh, I see some interesting uh, questions, both from from a normative but also from an institutional perspective because the one is coming from the office of the prosecutor the other is state driven the assembly of state parties thank you stavros can i follow up on that you know and give time um is there a special advisor at the IC, at the otp on uh, on this issue on environmental crimes i think there is a team that I'm not sure whether there is a, a concrete special advisor. I don't want to uh, misinform you um, okay. on this aspect. I know that they, they, they requested uh, feedback or at least, you know, they, there was a formal period of uh, consultations where they, um, they, they, they were accepting submissions on uh, certain questions they posed, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, I can't identify, you know, concrete uh, persons that are working uh, on these issues. Okay, and following up on that issue, because we move, I know many people are very much interested in crimes, in the language of crimes, and uh, many, many years, I mean, we talk about the inflation of rights, and I was wondering whether we, the, the counter argument is what happens with the inflation of crimes, you know, when you try to criminalize everything, what are the, the, the side effects of this over-criminalization? Uh, so um, there is the, the critique towards that when you can address something why do you need to frame it when you can address something differently and you already talk about you know this uh, maybe how it's going to work if there is a particular crime uh, separate like ecocide with with other crimes and what type of 
the risk of tension or, or other things. Uh, so so I was wondering about your thoughts about the so-called crime on ecocide. I mean, I, I know just only the idea, but is it also something which is on peace in peacetime apart from uh, from wartime? OK, great. OK, so yes, I, yes. I would like to address a little bit this critique of uh, jumping in to criminalize everything. Yes, actually, also, you know, this is a, a discussion that's been going on uh, since June 21 when the definition, the commentary were published. Of course, yeah, they also cover peacetime conduct. Uh, and um, that's why they wanted to cover, for example, uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, fulfilling again the mens rea requirements, um, unlawful or uh, wanton act, etc. Um, etc. Um, to be honest, I'm not so sure about this process. I mean, introducing it into the ICC statute. Uh, there were other discussions as well. For example, you, you could have a, a harmonization uh, convention. Uh, but again, the problem was that, for example, if it were adapted under the auspices of the Council of Europe, it's not universal. Um, so how can you, you know, um, achieve both purposes? universality and of course this idea of capturing uh, mass environmental harm. Uh, the other idea would be to have a convention, a universal international convention, every, uh, every state could subscribe to, to this one uh, and just build on existing uh, environmental crimes. Crimes, uh, conduct that is already criminalized in other environmental treaties. Okay, the counter argument there was that perhaps this is not so ambitious or that it doesn't carry the symbolic value that the ICC also brings with it. Uh, to be fair and to get back to your primary uh, question, I'm not so sure the ICC is the right forum right now, precisely because of all the other uh, criticism, questions, concerns it has been facing since its inception, actually. I, it never got rid uh, of these criticisms. Um, you know, uh, case of uh, um, the criticisms of uh, neocolonialism, selectivity, uh, budget, of course, as well, financial constraints. I'm not sure if expanding its jurisdiction in that respect uh, will bring added value. Uh, at this point of time, I'm not in principle opposed to that. I'm not so sure that this is the right timing uh, to go uh, for that step. We definitely need an international treaty, international crime. ICC statute, yes, sure, not now. That would be uh, my short uh, reply in this one. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, anyone else? I know that we have uh, an engaging uh, audience usually, you know, but maybe you 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 cover most of the things they would like to ask. Uh, you, we, we still have some time, you know, if anyone wants to take uh, the floor on a follow up or comment, it doesn't have to be a question. Uh, it's uh, we're always very very open <laughs> about that. I don't want to 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 occupy <laughs> uh, the the discussion. Um, please feel free. Um, differently, um, uh, I can I can follow up if that's okay with you, Stavros, on uh, um, on on your. I would say like reflective thoughts. I mean, already you on your final slide, you you put together uh, some of the of the conclusions. Um, but but I was wondering all these. Um, how can I say this in haste interest? You know, in a particular topic, what are the risks over there? <laughs> Is it? Would you say that it could be an issue of like a spont? It, how can I say? I don't want to say a trendy. You know, there there are issues that become trendy for a while. I don't want to trivialize, but you know what? I, the the focus yes. is very much on on a particular issue, and then somehow fades away, uh, and then we have see this over activity, hyperactivity by different bodies, uh, by different institutions. Um, so, is there a risk there, or or not, or what is your overall um, assessment uh, of these uh, uh, latest developments, because you gave us a, a historical trajectory yes. uh, from the Vietnam onwards, you know, the Iraq Kuwait invasion uh, on compensations. Again, a new interest with Ukraine, very, very much. Uh, but uh, but I was wondering, how do, you, how do you think that, where does it go? 
you know that's that's why because usually in international legal praxis expectations are raised and then there is disappointment but maybe this is not the case i i, I would say what, what what is your take maybe a final reflection in this regard thank you yeah, no. it's very interesting i mean the the other historical moment i have in mind which is which can be compared to the current one perhaps it's the, again the um, illegal invasion and occupation of kuwait by iraq um, UN Security Council activity. It established as a subsidiary organ, the UN Compensation Commission. Uh, it adjudicated and granted compensation for environmental claims. Um, but of course, this was also a unique moment. Uh, it's not easily uh, um, to be repeated. We know very well the conditions uh, were very special back in the day uh, in terms of you know veto powers and all that stuff we are all very much familiar with. Um, so we could have some interesting developments, especially when it comes to the documentation using the new technologies, a satellite imagery, a remote uh, geolocation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we could have some developments in that respect coming from the register for damage, uh, for example. Uh, yes, sure, I'm expecting something of uh, that uh, kind. But again, you know, when it comes to compensation for this type of damage, even for the UNCC, where Iraq at some point started participating in the process and started paid in due, its dues. Now we have to, you know, the, in the similar position, at some point in time, the Russian Federation will have to uh, find itself. And we have to imagine the situation, the Russian Federation is paying for environmental damage, of course. Okay. Uh, but even in that case, it took like two decades. Uh, the last payment was made um, almost, I don't know, three decades after uh, its last, inception. Sorry to interrupt. A student of mine told me only last year they completed uh, the, the, the UNCC, the last payment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. There were some problems 2003, the invasion, etc. They had some suspension because uh, Iraq was found in a difficult uh, financial situation. But you see, in this more easy case, in terms of its establishment and its of uh, and of its work. So, yes, uh, when it comes to documentation, practical aspects, and it's the same with UNEP, for example. We see how fast they are now in uh, intervening, uh, not having in mind anything like a military use of force, etc. Uh, but intervening, you know, technical interventions, identifying the risks. Uh, and calling for the appropriate remedial measures. Yes, on the technical and practical side of things, yes. At the normative level, there is a momentum which again resembles that moment. There was a discussion of the fifth Geneva Convention back then in the early 90s, uh, initiative by uh, Glenn Plant. Uh, fifth Geneva Convention in the sense of uh, you know dealing with uh, environmental harm, precisely and ex exclusively. Of course, as we all know, it fell through. Okay, some people, you know, they say that perhaps, uh, you know, it's the number that's not working, the uh, number five, the fifth international crime of the fifth Geneva Convention, but living inside all these prejudices, um, at the normative level, it remains to be seen how states will take up these uh, the principles. And to be fair, to give a fair account, a comprehensive account, there were some many voices uh, that were dismissive, not necessarily of the principle as a whole, but on different parts, it was not, you know, a very warm welcome. Even though many states express their views, we know now that on many matters they are views on Perak. Many states were supportive, of course, throughout all these ten-year-long uh, process. But still, it's not like um, a piece of cake uh, moving forward uh, with this uh, with this case. Uh, so all the hopes could at the normative level lie with the developments at, uh, within international criminal law, ecocide, etc. But as I mentioned before, um, I'm not so uh, optimistic uh, in that respect. The problem and the risk is that if you lose also that momentum, you know, then you will have to, to wait for the single event theory. They lost the momentum when it comes to the normative level of um, uh, the iraq Kuwait uh, situation, if I can put it like this. Uh, and then you have to wait for you know, three decades, even more so, to end up with um, another uh, legal initiative. Um, I'm really curious how this will end up. Perhaps ecocide, and again, what you highlighted before, linked to uh, peacetime conduct, climate change, because this seems, uh, it seems that it will be preoccupying all of us for many years and decades to come. 
So perhaps this aspect, which is not so much connected to our conflict, to be fair, uh, but still uh, ecocide only uh, for that part. Well, on that note, I would like to thank you so very much for this very rich uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I think um, you you touch upon several issues, um, more foundational issues, I would say, uh, than uh, how is the okay? There is a legal framework or an emerging legal framework, but uh, you 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 went into uh, you you reflected on the connection on the relationship of this legal framework and also on its prospects, which is important because usually you know we students ask, so what? <laughs> okay, there are things, but what is there outside? What is concrete? And uh, also the um, um, uh, highlighting other factors such as the momentum or the single event theory on how the overall context might uh, influence uh, legal development. I think that was very, very uh, important. Um, I would like to thank you very much for being with us today. I would like to thank Liz once more for coordinating this discussion. I would like to thank our pre um, um, audience. I know we had some problems with uh, with the Teams link this time, you know, and some people couldn't couldn't sign in. So apologies about that. Uh, but uh, Stavro, thank you, thank you very much. We look forward to to your work on these developments, and hopefully we'll see each other very soon. Thank you all very very much and have a good uh, day thank you stavros thank you thank you thank you bye bye all thanks bye.